Welcome to the Valley College Connection, where John Kawai and Scott Wigan, two Valley professors, engage in a conversation about success with educators and students. Each week, they'll sit down with a different guest to find out ways each of us have had to plan, persevere, and overcome to where we are now. The show will also highlight resources and services that are working to make a difference at Valley College. So we are joined by Dr. Ron Mosler, Chair of the Psychology Department here at Los Angeles Valley College. Thank you so much for sitting down with us this afternoon, Ron. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. We wanted to start off, as we typically do, with getting uh, some of your background, if you can share with us the path that led you here to Valley College. Okay. Um, well, I was, a, uh, I was an undergraduate at UCLA. I actually got to UCLA as an engineering student, which was a really tough major to get into, and it was dumb because I changed majors um, almost immediately. Um, I didn't know, actually, what I wanted to do uh, at the time, but I began to take classes that interested me. I, I literally went through the UCLA catalog page by page when it was a paper catalog. Um, it was one of the ways that I got into an astronomy class because it started with an A. <laughs> um, no kidding. Um, and I switched from uh, engineering uh, slash physics to um, economics to undeclared. And in my third, in my, when I was registering for classes when I was a senior, I was flagged because I wasn't allowed to register because I had senior units, but I hadn't declared a major yet. And I went to see the counselor, and the counselor said, you must declare a major so that you can graduate. And I said, okay. I said, and we both looked at my transcripts, and we both said, well, it looks like you've taken all the psych classes. I guess you're a psych major. And I said, yeah, I'm a psych major. So my senior year, I spent uh, taking GE classes um, and, schools in, and classes in the graduate school and the medical school, graduate school of psychology. Um, Graduated there, um, I went to Cal State Northridge for my master's degree um, because I wasn't a good student at UCLA the first couple of years. I was not a great student. Let, um, let me pause you there for a second. Yeah. So can we roll it back a little bit further? Were you a good student in high school? What led you from high school to being an engineering major? How did you get to UCLA? Where, can you fill that in for, for a sec? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was not a great student. Uh, my goal in elementary school was to leave having finished my homework and having folded it and shoved it into my back pocket so that I could go back later and just play. So I was really into activity, any type of uh, physical activity, basketball, baseball, anything. And was this organized or was this just on nope, the playground? No, just pick up. It was just pick up. I played organized ball as well, but it was a lot of pick up. In elementary school, junior high, I could get away with, um, with minimal work and passing classes. I got A's, B's, and occasional C. Um, high school, it was the same thing. Uh, algebra 2 trig class in high school. I remember my teacher saying the first day, hey, I'm not going to grade any of the homework. And I thought to myself, this is awesome. I don't have to do the homework. <laughs> and so throughout the semester, she would say, Ron, do you have the homework? And I would say, no, I don't. And we did not have a good relationship because of that. And, um, and I still got an A in the class because I could do the work. I got an AUU, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, <laughs> so a unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory that's for correct. participation? Or uh, <laughs> right, all of that. I was, and, and I deserved it. Um, although she did get the last laugh because years later when I got my official transcript through uh, LAUSD, um, she actually gave me a BUU. So on <laughs> my card, she gave me an AUU, but officially a BUU. So she did have the last laugh. But it still got me into UCLA. So I did have good enough grades. I had good enough test grades. And did you know that you wanted to go to UCLA right, right out of high school? Was that like the school yes. choice? Yes. It was the – I um, came from a family that didn't have a lot of experience with college. My dad was a Holocaust survivor. Um, so he um, – obviously an immigrant. And um, so when – uh, when a time came for me to apply to schools, I had no idea how to do it. There wasn't a lot of outreach at the school, so far as I remember. And uh, my application to UCLA, it was the first of all, it was the only college I applied to. Pretty dumb. When I wrote out my application, I did it by hand. No typewriter. One draft. My, my personal essay was one draft by hand. I remember it had mistakes in it. I crossed things out. I used whiteout, all of that. Wow. And, uh, and, I, and I actually got rejected at first, and then I wrote an appeal letter uh -huh. saying, please, 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 will you let me in? And in retrospect, they probably looked at it as, oh, look at this kid. He has no clue about college, but he has good test scores. This is the type of person that really is disadvantaged in that way. 
um, although you know by that time my family was middle class but clearly they probably saw something in that oh yeah you know it's like this is a person that can really be shaped well i really question whether usually really reads the essays I mean, I think of my SAT, it was a mess. I think back, yeah. back when we were going to school, I really doubt they looked at the Well, it's the 1800s, too. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but I, 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 I do hear you with that whole, you know, after school, playing on the playground, sports. And that was sort of a tradition at my elementary school. Even after high school, we would go back to our elementary school and there'd be right. pickup games. Me, too. And that doesn't exist anymore. Right. You can't do it anymore. They close them down. They're afraid of some kid falling Liability. down. Liability. Right. My dad went to the school board um, to get the gate opened, and his argument was, look, all of these kids, they all climb the fences. It's better just to leave the gate open. Actually safer. <laughs> right. right. And so they got the gate open, and there's, to this day, there's a bar that keeps the gate open enough for a person to walk through. I remember um, when the gates were closed, we'd have to get our bikes over, and you'd have one person on a eight foot on the top of the eight-foot fence, right. right? And you would heave your bike to him, and you'd have to have – and then he would – pull it over and heave it over again and yeah and there's this real sadness when you look at movies like sandlot things uh -huh. like that where that just doesn't exist anymore right right it's all so organized yeah. which city did you grow up in uh la uh west the other side of the hill and then sure. um when you went to ucla was it a culture shock it was i there wasn't a great orientation um back then the f the closer you lived to the school the less likely it was to live in to get a dorm even if you lived in, a, in the valley, sometimes you couldn't get a dorm. And so I didn't get a dorm space. So I had to live at home for the, you know, until I could afford to move out. And so I wasn't really connected to the school at first. And that was definitely a detriment to my education. It would have absolutely helped me if there was an orientation and something to marry me to the campus. And other than, you know, athletics and, you know, hanging out with the people I liked, there really wasn't anything that kept me on campus. Yeah, I think that's been a big problem at UCLA. It's probably partly because you're Jewish. I was part, my first year there, I, I did the AAP program, which was for minorities. Uh -huh. And I was there because my, my, uh, my English was so bad. Uh -huh. and really? Unfortunately, yeah, it's my wow. only. Fortunately, it's the only language I know. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't know that. But, no, they, yeah, so they, you know, like they, they looked at it like, wow, this kid's math scores are high. His English is terrible. He can't write an essay. So they sent me into this full-on orientation that first semester. Uh -huh. But it is this unfair thing where if you're just around there, and you're just not the right demographic that's targeted, you're just out. Right, right. So when you went to CSUN, what was the big plan? So my big plan was to get back to UCLA. I, my master's degree was in counseling psychology. I made sure I did everything possible. I was the first ever uh, teaching assistant in the graduate program. Um, I was taking a graduate program in statistics, um, educational statistics, and the people in the class weren't getting it, and it was frustrating me because it was easy for me. And so I went up to the instructor and I said, you know, maybe we could do this and this and trying to help the students, you know, learn it this way. And she said, would you like to teach the class? And I said, absolutely, I would. And she said, you can't give tests and you can't grade papers. But, and this was a class I was actually enrolled in. And I said, I think that would be a terrific idea. And so I got to teach the class for the rest of the semester with, you know, one or two gaps in there. And they had some teacher of record that just sort of graded things. And right. She sat in the room while I was teaching. Um, if there was anything that I couldn't answer, but she gave me the lesson plans and she gave me the book and she said, go ahead. And, wow. And that was, it was a great experience for me. I'm not sure how I would feel if I was a student, uh, you know, where right. another student in the class was now teaching it. Well, um, I don't know how I would feel as a teacher with a teacher, with a student come up, coming up to me and going, you know, I think I could do this better. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that. I just said, um, I was a little bit frustrated at the level that students were presenting, you know, the mm -hmm. level of, you know, thought and the, the level of, um, you know, how much information that they were absorbing. And she agreed. So, so you, you just kept ahead of the class. You just read the book. You were a couple weeks ahead. And well, I think, um, you know, UCLA, you know, must have prepared me in some way, um, you know, taking an advanced ed stat class or something like that. I don't really recall. I just knew that I already knew the information. Mm -hmm. um, at UCLA, in fact, as an, yeah, as an undergraduate, I took, I think, probably the last class where we had to use punch cards. Okay. Um, so um, I think the rigor was a little bit different for that type of class. Mm -hmm. 
It was a big mainframe. It was like, it was crazy. I hired someone to do the punch cards for me. <laughs> so I did, you know, I had 700 punch cards. So, so hold, hold on, pause for the generation gap here. Yeah. Punch card, describe, what are we talking say. about here? So punch cards, um, it's a way for computer to uh, for a computer to read information. Now we can input it with a keyboard. Um, back in the day, you, you still used a keyboard, but um, sort of like um, QR codes, um, but more physical, um, where there's... You know, chads where you know you punch holes instead of um, actually reading a computer image. So if you had any statement, any one statement, one line that you had written on a computer, you would put it on a punch card and then feed it into the computer, and your results would come on the other side. Hmm. And then, so think about every line th that you ever wrote, right? Every sentence would be a punch card. Right. And then, like a Scantron yeah, almost. I was one generation mm -hmm. right after you, yeah. and I remember the punch card professors used to make fun of us, of you and your fancy monitors. <laughs> you, you know, like, you know, punch cards, you know, you, they're, they're, like, they're like impervious. Like you drop your, your, your monitor in the water, or if it rains on it, it'll, it's gone. And right. we used to like joke about like, well, what if you tripped and you just dropped your punch cards everywhere, right? Your if history. they're ever out of order. Yeah, if you have one that's not correct, it messes up the entire program. Wow. It's like writing, writing one bad character of code. You mm. have to go find it. So. Except it's like looking at a phone directory. Right. right. Find the one misspelling in a phone directory. That, that's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I hired someone to do it. I just didn't want to learn one more thing. Mm -hmm. And turns out, Good decision. Good, good call, right? Yeah, some things, some things to. better to have someone else do. Let, let me go back just a second here, because yeah. here you are at CSUN now in, in, in the narrative and, and clearly excelling, pioneering a new program, having this really amazing opportunity and responsibility as well. But you'd said prior to that when you were at UCLA, it was kind of by default that you ended up as a psych major in that senior year. But you must have taken along the way all these psych classes to yes. have those. Now, as you were going through it, did you were you consciously sort of attracted to these psychology courses or was it sort of just convenient as far as what was scheduled or like how how were you getting into these psych classes and what was it that was compelling about them to you as you were sort of going down this path yeah well all of that i think um that first of all those were the classes that caught my interest um i enjoyed the psych classes um and when i was so 1981 so um, when I was still, I guess, a sophomore or so, um, I got a job first as a tutor and then as an educational therapist. And as an educational therapist, I worked a lot um, with the learning disabled population. I started to, uh, and that sort of morphed later into doing psychotherapy and behavior therapy as I became licensed. Um, but during the, during the early 1980s, as an educational therapist, the classes in psychology informed the job and the job informed the classes, so I was able to use a lot of the information in real life in my essays and things like that. Wow. It really um, interested me. Um, as, I, as I tell my students, we might be jumping a little bit ahead right here, but okay. one of the things I, I tell my students is we, we make a lot about you know following your passion, and I don't always think that that's great advice for everybody. I think it's important to follow your skills and your opportunities, and it was pretty clear at the time I had a, I had these skills where I could work with children and I could work in an educational environment and I was patient and that type of thing. Um, all those people here wouldn't necessarily say I'm patient <laughs> sometimes. Um, I'm actually quite patient um, when I'm working uh, educationally. So when you were working so, with, these, with, with these children, what was the setup? A private office. Okay, and when did and, this happen? This was a after UCLA? or? After I know, this UCLA? was during. So while I'm going to UCLA, that was... Uh, that and I was also a, a DJ, and those were my two primary sources of income. So I was going to school full time. I was a DJ whenever I could on the weekends, and I was working during the week as an educational therapist. Um, and that's how I supported myself. And um, and so yeah, that's how I got into. That's how I really got the push into psychology because I knew that I could do that, and I knew that I could make a career out of it, and I really liked it. Right. And I think right. That sometimes it's underemphasized that, oh, this is a thing that you're really good at. I bet there's something in this field that would interest you. Right. As opposed to, here's something I'm passionate about. There's no opportunities. There's no jobs. Right. And, you know, I don't really excel at it, but I'm really passionate about it. I don't think that's always a good choice for students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're in that class. Now you're TA and you're teaching the second half of the class. And that's, your, aside from tutoring and the work that you just described, is this really your first foray into teaching then? Um, at that point, I had done some tutoring in high school, um, you, I, I can't 
ever recall getting paid for it. But I know that there were some parents who said, hey, can you, you know, help out my kid? And I always said yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was always fine. And, um, and my peers and their younger siblings seemed to respond pretty well. Um, in, in one of my books, in fact, I do write, just to go back a little bit, yeah. I do write that had the opportunity arisen, you know, when when I was 17, my first uh, quarter at UCLA, had the opportunity arisen where, oh, here's this lab, this physics lab or something like that, um, and we have this opportunity for you to tutor in physics or for you to, you know, get involved in this activity. It's very possible that I would be, you know, a physics teacher and writing physics books now right. instead of, you know, psych teacher and psych books. Right. Um, so I, it, it was more of that opportunity, and I absolutely enjoyed working with other people on a one-to-one basis, um, sometimes in a group basis, but more often on a one-to-one basis and, you know, in a tutoring type of uh, situation. And so when that job, you know, poked up on the, uh, on the UCLA job board, that's when I applied for it. Yeah. And he wanted a graduate student, by the way, okay. and I just lied. Okay. <laughs> I said I was a graduate student. I, I told him, we became very good friends later. I told him six months later, I came into his office. I said, you know, Paul, I, I'm really, really, really sorry about this, but I, I have something to confess. And, and he, he had this really shocked look on his face. And I said, I'm really sorry. I'm not a graduate student. I'm just a junior. And he goes, oh, thank goodness. I thought you were going to quit. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was just a different world back then. Right. right. You could get away with that. Yeah. It was aspirational. Yeah. I, was, I was always looking for that next better job. And, but I had that job for almost 20 years. Oh, I, really? Wow. Yeah, until I, um, until I got this full-time job. Wow. So it, it morphed. The, morphed in, I would, became a psychotherapist. I would, became licensed. So, oh. mm-hmm. you know. so at CSUN, you, got, you, be, you were licensed then to become a counselor? To be able to counsel I was in a master's program. I was mm-hmm. in the MFT program there. Okay. Uh, and so during that time... Um, so the, the pre-1500 hours and the post-1500 hours, so I became licenced during that process. Then during what that you, process. Why, why don't you explain what an M- MFT is? Um, so marriage Family Therapist, I think. So at the time it was Marriage Family Child Therapist, but it's morphed into Marriage Family Therapist because so many therapists don't work with children. Um, I was already working with children, and so at that time most of my practicum was uh, done at my office, so I could see... Um, some of the same clients, I could get some of the same referrals with a supervisor. I had a supervisor there where my colleagues or my peers in, in classes, they were paying to have supervision and they were paying a monthly fee to get through their practicum hours. I was getting paid. I couldn't have afforded not to have gotten paid. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got paid. Um, I worked with a lot of children. I worked with a lot of pediatricians, some hospitals, um, but they all came to me and did a lot of workshops, did a lot of in-service, things like that. And so that all contributed to my 3,000 hours that I needed to do. Everybody in the state of California needs any type of license, uh, marriage family therapist license, a psychologist, a, um, uh, a social worker. We all need 3,000 hours of supervised um, interning before we get licensed. And so and an MFT, a marriage family therapist, does the same things as a clinical psychologist, um, is allowed to do this mostly the same things, but without the same backing. Um, without obviously without the same experience would you still recommend people to get an mft or is there a different licensing that you would recommend now i wouldn't in fact i do specifically tell students that one of the issues with mfts is if you go to um, ventura boulevard ventura boulevard is filled with mfts and if you network there's nobody wants to give you clients everybody wants to get clients so networking is really a one-way street um, and you really have to carve out a niche a niche um, in order to be successful as an MFT. And I, I, there's this myth where, oh, I can just become a, a licensed therapist and then, you know, and people will come pay me $100 an hour. And it doesn't work that way. Um, you really have to have some type of skill besides just hanging out a shingle. And so that's what I tell students is that they really need to, in my case, it, I worked with children and um, before applied behavioral analysis was called ABA, um, I did a lot of behavior therapy and I worked with a lot of conduct disorders. I did a lot of parenting. So I had that clientele that other people didn't want. Um, in fact, I was well known in the Valley for, oh, you don't want your kid on medication, um, go see Ron. Uh, and any time that occurred, I would talk to doc- their, the, the kid's uh, physician, um, and then that physician would get to know me, and that physician would, uh, would refer me as well. Wow, this, so. is, this is all while you're at CSUN working on, on, on CSUN your master's. And, and then right, so that was while I was working, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you, but um, yeah, so that was while 
before I got my master's, you, you can do a maximum of 1,500 hours. And then after master's, um, you can do a, a, you have to do at least 1,500 hours. So it was during that time mm -hmm. where I was at CSUN and UCLA where that was the case. So it sounds like at this point, you're, you, you've gone from an experience as a student at UCLA where, as you described it, you weren't the best student. You finish, you get into CSUN, and now it sounds like you're hyper-focused. I mean, here you are pioneering a program. You're working all these different capacities. You know, making money, helping the community. It's a pretty, pretty significant you know, shift from, from one university to the next university. And so as, as you're finishing up now your master's program, is your eye already on the, 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 the come back to UCLA? Or what are you thinking yes. at that point? Yeah, during that time. That was still my goal, okay. was to come back. And, and I can actually pinpoint the, the actual day that I did transition from being not a good student into one that was more interested in being a good student. It was one day that I was sitting in the back of a personality psychology class in the back room of a room that sat 350, 400 people in Franz Hall. And, uh, and the instructor, uh, the professor was asking a question and I knew the answer to the question and I didn't say anything because I'm sitting in the back row. You can't sit, say anything in the back row of a 400 seat lecture hall. And, uh, um, and I knew the answer and, and there were five or six people that answered the question. They were all wrong. And I was thinking, I, I should be paying more attention. And so I began to, that semester in that class, I began to move up closer and closer until by the end of the semester, I was like the third or the fourth row, which is where I'm most comfortable now anyway. And uh, except in a meeting. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I think you and I are usually in the back. Yeah. Making snide remarks. <laughs> yes. Um, and so from that day on, I became a better student. And it wasn't a one-day transition. It wasn't a one-semester transition. It took at least a year for me to really more than a year for me to become a better student. Um, and by the time I got to CSUN, now I was a good student. Okay. And I was in a cohort with a number of people who were more interested in graduating and getting a license. And I was really interested in the academics and teaching and research and that type of thing. So I did those things while I was at CSUN in order to get back to UCLA. So did you, you went back to UCLA immediately, immediately then after you graduated? Yeah, so I, um, so I graduated top of my class, um, I did research, I did teaching, I applied at UCLA, and I got rejected again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough time. We were planning a wedding, we were buying a house, and I was getting rejected at UCLA. So I immediately called the person who signed the letter, and I said, hey, you know, I want to know why I got rejected. And he said, well, I'm not really sure. Let me call you back. So he called me back 20 minutes later. He said, well, it turns out we never looked at your application because of your undergraduate GPA. He said, my undergraduate GPA was less than 3.0. And so because of that, they never looked at my application. And so I quickly rattled off all the reasons why I should be accepted. He said, you're absolutely right. You're the type of student we need. Let me see what I can do. And so he called me back another 20 minutes or later, and he said, you're accepted. Wow. And he <laughs> got a quorum in the hallway, and he became my advisor, and we became good friends later as well. And he became my advisor, and I worked with him. Um, and he said, and he, he offered uh, to get me into the clinical psych program. I said I wasn't interested in the clinical psych program. I wanted the counseling psych program. He said, yeah, you're a better fit there anyway. And so that's how I got back to UCLA. They don't accept master's students for the most part. They only want... Um, bachelors, they they want to, they want to form you and shape you, the whole you time. You don't need a master's to get your PhD. Correct. It's just a it's a step on the way, yeah. and I had to do the same work as a. So did you have to take two years of classes all over again? Yeah, but I took I was able to take different classes, okay. and as you know, graduate school is way different. It, you know, students think that graduate school is so much harder. That graduate school is so much easier, especially because you're studying the things that you want to study. Right. And they usually curve it on a, between a B, at about a B plus. Right. Yeah. If you get a C, you're failing. Yeah. You've you, done something wrong. That, exactly. And so, then I want to push on this whole uh, point of appealing because that really works. I mean, it. it really I guess. Does I don't know if it still does. It still does. I had a I had a friend. She um, she had appealed. They said no from UCLA. Appealed again. Said no. Then the third time, she sent ten copies of the send of the same letter, and she said there was probably more than one person reviewing these and only one person has to say yes so uh -huh. at the end she's like, I'm already a no what am I going to do so she sent 10 copies of the same letter and someone said yes to one of those 10 copies that's terrific right and at the end of the day you already don't have the job if they're upset that you call them who cares right right right, what right. Do you care? <laughs> that's right 
right. That's terrific. How long ago was that? This was uh, this was when I went, but I still hear I tell students all the time like the no's not a no until you've talked to someone, right? And they've looked you in the face and said absolutely not, right? And uh, I had another student who was rejected from Berkeley because she w- she had applied to some nonprofit, found out it was sixty thousand dollars a year, and she had no money, so she didn't take a class, but she had wrote it on her application. And since they didn't have all the transcripts, a transcript of the school she didn't go to, and they said, give us $60,000 and we'll give you a blank transcript. Wow. So, you know, I had her call all the colleges that she was accepted to, uh, that she was rejected to, to explain the situation. And Berkeley said, yeah, you're right. You shouldn't pay $60,000. Let's re-review your application. And this happened last year. Wow. wow. You know, and I'm a big believer of... Anytime you can make something subjective, make it subjective. Make right. it, you know, have someone say no to your face. Yeah. It's hard to say no to your face. Yeah. And if you can, if you can find someone's office, make them say no to your face. And, you know, you're yeah. in the same place that you were before if they say no. Right. Nothing, right. And nothing that, lost. I mean, that's such a big issue now with immigration. It, you know, when people reject whole groups of people. It's much easier to do that if you don't actually know anyone. Right. And you yeah. meet one person, and it can change the entire face of you know, your perception. Right. And Suddenly it becomes personal. Right. Yeah. And that's, it's so important, and that's why diversity is so important. And there, you know, the people that don't accept that, they clearly haven't met anyone of any importance to them. Right. And I always figure that if one person is going to get an unfair advantage, why not me? I'll be, see, I'll be that person. See, I don't, I don't use those same words. I always say, use your resources. Oh, I say, I, I, think, I try to make life unfair in my advantage. All the time. <laughs> it's, you're, Every, you're using resources. <laughs> you're using resources, whatever they are. That's the kind way of saying it. <laughs> well, it definitely undermines, uh, underscores the importance of persistence and, and not being scared to ask. I mean, right. that's speaking your mind. So I, I love that about your story, Ron. I mean, it's it's interesting that that happened twice at UCLA. Right. So so there it is. Now now you're accepted into the the, the, the PhD program. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like it's your life point too. There's a lot of transition happening. You said marriage, house, new program. Yes. Oh, interesting time. Yes. Yeah. It, crazy. Yeah. I always say you know, and then kids came right after that. So I would say I, I was probably sleep deprived for 25 years. <laughs> so you were in grad school with new kids. Um, while I was in graduate school, and then Northridge earthquake happened too, and we had to move into my parents' home, and so that was fun. How was the experience of grad school and kids? I hear both sides of it. Most people usually tell me it's good because you usually don't have that kind of time at home. It motivated me to finish. So it, the earthquake um, really motiv- motivated me to finish because we had to rebuild our house from the ground up. And so while I was in graduate school, I, I, we had a, a less than one-year-old and less than three-year-old um, but soon to be turning one and three. It was extremely stressful, extremely stressful, living in one room in a house and uh, and rebuilding the house and going to grad school. It was very, very stressful. But at the same time, it really pushed me to finish. How long was the program? Five years and okay. took me eight. Okay. Uh, and part of it was, you know, I'm working full time. Part of it, what I worked with the Phoenix House. Uh, part of my dissertation was it, my dissertation was in ad- addiction studies, and um, part of it was not getting um, not getting the support of one faculty member, um, and part of it was which delayed me a, an entire year, and another part of it was not getting everybody at Phoenix House on my schedule, which right. was understandable and, mm-hmm. and not unusual for research as well. Did you ever, along the way, start to lose hope or think that, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to finish this? Or was there just never an option? Like no, It wasn't an option, like right. you said. It's, it's not an option. Right. Um, it's one of the things I talk about in, in my classes today, that you know, when I went to elementary school, not doing homework was not an option. It just wasn't an option. High school, same thing. I might do a horrible job. It might be really sloppy, but I'm going to finish it. It wasn't an option. And that has certainly changed now that <coughs> students very often look at homework as it's an option. It's, not, it's optional. I'm not sure if I'll get to it. I'm not sure that if I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And I think that has clearly changed in the culture of students that, that I've noticed. Right. Well, you know, when we were going to school, the average college student studied 40 hours. And the average college student now studies 16 Wow. So, you know, when you remove 24 hours of what you did, right. all of a sudden, you know, 
You have lots of options. You have lots of options. <laughs> what was your thesis or your dissertation on? Um, it was concerned ego deficits and addiction. I didn't buy the medical model. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a paper um, as in my first year. And my advisor, uh, the chair of my committee, just loved it. And he worked with John Vasconcelos, and he worked with um, people in, in the state of California who were involved in addiction and self-esteem. And he said, you have to pursue this. Because and, and he was a former addict, um, and he also didn't buy into the medical model as hard as most of the other community. And so mm -hmm. I, I presented both scholarly evidence and then, then my research um, dealt with the same. What was the medical model? The medical model is addiction is a disease. Okay. And we can't look at it as any other way other than as a disease. Um, and for the most part, the medical community has hijacked most of psychology. Everything is medication. Everything is a disease. Clearly, there's been a shift more recently into neuropsychology, which is good. But uh, And at the same time, even though it's similar to the medical model, it's still very, very different because it uses the environment as an agent of change rather than just, oh, this is the way your brain is. This is the way that you were born. You are addicted, and you can't do anything about it. And evidence doesn't show that and yet all we really hear is that and I don't want I don't ever discourage anybody from doing 12-step programs or anything like that never I don't discourage people from doing anything um, I just suggest that um, there are other ways of looking at the same type of issue I, I always called addiction um, I, I look at addiction as like a disease but it isn't necessarily something that infects people that you can't get rid of. Right, and that seems like I was just going to say from you know a very sort of superficial outside kind of understanding of it that that's the typical rhetoric that's used around it in that model is that once you have it, you have it. So if, if you're you know if alcoholism is a disease, then you're always going to have it, and if you if you're sober, then you can't drink again because you're gonna then you know relapse into something like alcoholism. But so the model you're describing, you know, not necessarily so. And you mentioned the language of ego deficit. Right, so that, that, was, that was in the title of my dissertation, was an ego deficit, in that uh, one of the things I talk about still is that what we don't tell children, for instance, is that using drugs feels good. Right. And we we want to shy away from that. It does feel good. And, um, and so if you are feeling bad emotionally or physically sometimes, um, doing drugs makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. And we really need to, you know, grasp that and, and talk about that in an honest way right. in order to then address the issue about overuse. Sure. Right, right. So once you finished UCLA, what happened? Um, it was actually just sort of a, an easy transition into private practice. I can tell you professionally what happened. Mm -hmm. So before I graduated UCLA, if I had someone who was hospitalized for an emotional uh, mental disorder, um, I would call up and I'd say, I'd, I'd need to talk to the attending psychiatrist. And I'd say, hi, this is Ron Mossler. And I need to talk to Dr. So-and-so uh, about my patient. And uh, I always use patient when, you know, when I'm talking to a, a hospital. And they would say, oh, you know, who are you again? I'd say, Ron Mossler, I'm the therapist. Said, okay, just a second. And they'd get back to me inevitably, you know, a minute or two later, said, oh, Dr. So-and-so, we'll call you later. After I got my PhD, I would call up that same hospital or you know, any, another hospital and say, hi, this is Dr. Mossler. I need, I need to speak to Dr. Miller. So, yeah, he'll be right with you. And then, you know, a minute later. That was the big difference. And I could, uh, I could sign my own insurance papers. Yeah, isn't that funny how that whole doctor thing works? Right. I, it works for me also. They put me in a meeting. They go, this is Dr. Kawhi, and they always assume I'm doctor, whatever that meeting right. is, and I never am. Right, right? right? And it's, <laughs> it's so funny because it's like faux credibility. <laughs> All right, so, so let me tell you a story. So, um, so, after, so again, I'm living at my parents' house. Um, after the after the earthquake, I earned my PhD. Uh, my mom um, has typical type of you know she she played pan and she played mahjong, mm -hmm. a typical you know women's group, older and you know they always knew me and I'd walk in and they hi Ronnie what's going on and so I'd so I walked in this one particular day right after I I sat for my final orals, and uh, and one of the women said hi Ronnie you know what's new and I said well I just earned my doctorate degree. Um, just last week, I sat for my final orals, so I'm done. I'm Dr. Mossler now. And, uh, and my mom, who's sitting there, she was the first one to say, yeah, but he's not a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always my line. Yeah, I'm not a real doctor. 
Thanks, Mom. The only uh, the only advanced degree in the family, but yeah, it's, it's all good. Immediately undermined. Right, immediately, immediately. So it was, you know, humbling, and you know, it's, I I use that I use that line all the time. Yeah, I'm not a real doctor. Okay, so then, did you come start teaching immediately after? No. So it was the mid '90s. Um, so in the meantime, I had. There was a, an old Saturday Night Live skit with, um, I think it was they, a family from the Bahamas or Jamaica or something, right. where it's like, you know, how many jobs you got? <laughs> and that was the line that all my family and friends used because I took whatever job I could get that got me more experience. It was sort of the next level job. So I worked at the Dubinoff Center, which is very similar to the, uh, the help group across the street from us. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked with uh, LAUSD in crisis prevention um, and crisis management after the earthquake. I did a lot of screen for FEMA and people would ask me to do different jobs different consulting jobs and I took them all um, because I wanted each job to lead to the next better job Um, I worked uh, in LA County jails with the probation department which was fantastic because they paid a ton of money even today it would be a lot of money I remember getting $90 an hour um, and that was in the early 90s and I counseled I transitioned people from the jail into outside Mm -hmm. Um, and so um, by the mid-90s or, or so, I had a pretty long CV of activities. I did a lot of writing. Um, I did volunteer writing. I had one paid position at a magazine um, that folded. And, and what kind of things did you write about? I did uh, an article on sports psychology. Were you textbook writing at this point, too? No, not at all. I had some ideas. In fact, my first book idea was there was one particular family that I worked with, and they would... Um, ask for advice and I gave them advice about their child who was a little bit active and um, and she would say on a you know two or three times a month she would say just wait till you have kids and so that was going to be the first the title of my first book wait till you have kids (laughs) Um, and and it turns out and I always remembered that it turns out I did do the same things that I was offering to her I did do the same thing with my kids right so it wasn't something that you know it's like oh yeah I can tell other people but I'm not going to take my own advice so I did. So I, I continued to do the same work in the 1990s as I was doing in the 80s. I just expanded it because now I'm licensed and I'm on my own. Um, I have a doctorate now. And so my client base expanded a little bit. But I was always, I was, I can't remember a time where I was really wanting for clients um, compared to my colleagues that I would have conversations with. I worked with kids, I worked with couples, I worked with families. And you know, there would be times where I would say, uh, where a person would call up and, and ask for time, and I'd say, I'm sorry, all I have is at you know, 9 o'clock on a Wednesday night, and, it, and, it, and you have to pay full fee if you're coming at that time, because I saw people for free, I saw people for $5 an hour, and they would say yes, and I would just go, oh, <laughs> you know, hoping that they would, would have said no. Um, I worked with uh, Age Project LA, transitioned into the Pacific Center, so I did a volu- lot of volunteer counseling with, uh, with people who were dying of HIV. That was, they needed a lot of therapists back in the 90s. So how do you cope with all this? I mean, you, you work with a lot of heavy issues every day. How do you cope with all of it? How do you go home and then have dinner and not yell at your kids? Um, <laughs> you know, for me, it was, it's always about being with that person in the moment. Mm-hmm. And I never had a problem transitioning home. It was one of the, it was, although it was also one of the reasons why I, did, why I gave up the private practice was actually getting home and then having to do phone calls, um, insurance billing, and things like that. I loved the hour in the office. I hated anything outside the office where I had to make phone calls and be my own secretary, and that was tough for me. But as far as um, I've actually been asked that question a lot, it was never an issue for me um, outside because I could be present for my clients. I could work with them at the time. I could feel good about it at the time. And so because I was feeling good during that hour, once I left, I was okay with it until the, you know, the next time I would see them. And then you said you kept looking for uh, the next better job. What was the, the goal that you were working towards, ultimately? Uh, to be a director. or uh, My ultimate goal was to be a college professor. So I wanted to be a college professor. I also, if I was going to stay in private practice, I wanted to be a director of an agency. I knew I had that skill. Um, I definitely wanted that money that went with it. Um, I, wa- I did apply for one position at the Dubinoff Center, in fact. Um, I applied for that position. They gave the position to the person who had been there longer. And I said, okay, then, you know, I'm out of here. And they said, no, 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 we don't want you to leave because, you know, we think you're, you're still really good here. I said, yeah, but that was the position I was aiming for. I, d- I don't want to be a staff uh, counselor. 
And uh, a number of months later, they called me up and said, hey, you know, that person left. You know, we'd, we'd really like you to be the director. And I said, yeah, sorry, I've moved on. Mm -hmm. um, so it was that that was the type of position I wanted where I was directing a lot of people because I, I and not because not solely because of the money. It was more because I didn't want that responsibility of the insurance billing and the phone calls and everything else. And I felt like I could also contribute by supervising and helping other people in their work. Mm -hmm. Where did, uh, where did Los Angeles Valley College come into play in, in, in this part of it here? Um, so I started uh, teaching in the child development p department at, uh, at CSUN. And, um, and I started teaching statistics here at Valley in oh. 1996. Okay. Um, they needed somebody immediately. It was December and you know summer school was starting or, or winter session was starting. So I did that. And then the following summer at Valley, I remember this phone call as well. I actually, <laughs> I got a page on my pager, <laughs> um, and I called back the chair of the psych department, and he said, "Oh, we need someone to teach psych too." And I said, "Great, I can do that." He said, "The class starts next week. This was on a Monday. Class starts next Monday. It's a, it, it was either a four or five week summer session class." And I said, yep, I can do that, great. And he gave me a little bit more information, and I got off the phone, and I thought, I have no idea what Psych 2 is. <laughs> I literally had no idea. And it turns out it's clearly the hardest psych class to teach. It's biological psych. Oh, wow. And so I, I got my, my old UCLA textbook out. I talked to one of the instructors who um, was teaching Psych 2 at, at Valley. I, I remember I talked to him on a Wednesday. And during that entire session, it must have been five weeks, I just made sure that I was a week or two ahead of all the students. Right. Um, and so that got me into Valley and got me teaching more classes at Valley. I was still teaching at CSUN in the child development department. Still with your private practice, too? And still with my private okay. practice, both. Yeah, okay. so part-time, part-time. And I, I think by that time, I had probably, w I, I don't think I had any outside jobs other than, you know, the occasional, occasional consultation. Mm -hmm. I worked with LAUSD in doing some statistical work, mm -hmm. um, some research for them. But other than that, I think I was down to private practice and teaching at Valley and teaching at CSUN. And then in 1999, both the child development department at CSUN and uh, Valley College had openings. Mm. And, um, and both places asked me to, to apply. And I was kind of foolish. And uh, sort of the same thing when I applied to UCLA as an undergraduate. It's like, yeah, I'd really rather teach at Valley, so I'm only going to apply there. <laughs> Unfortunately, it worked out. Right. And, uh, and I, I preferred Valley because they wanted someone to work days. And at the same time, I also wanted to teach. And I knew at CSUN they wanted me to do more projects, which would have been fine. I would have been very happy in the child development department doing projects. That would have been okay. But I also wanted to teach. And I also wanted um, to work uh, with children who had learning disabilities and who were less able um, in education than the average child and not, and I'm not suggesting that's the case with Valley College, but I really wanted that opportunity to teach more stu a, a greater variety of students rather than you know more the upper division child development uh, at CSUN. So, and what changes um, have you noticed at Valley College over the arc of what 20 years? That's a good question. Um, I think um, I've seen um, faculty and administrators become more divisive. I think there's more division between faculty and administrators, so uh, for one. 20 years ago, were the faculty and administrators, were they sort of, was there more communication? There was, like there was more communication. There was clearer communication. There was, a more, there was more willingness to work together. And I, sometimes I feel like we're butting heads. And I don't think it necessarily needs to be that way. Because when you describe that, <laughs> I came in here uh, 10 years ago. I can't imagine administration necessarily working hand in hand with faculty. Not that they're against us. Yeah. But I've never really, as a math department, sat with my dean and made really big de decisions. Right. They've always been siloed. Uh -huh. They kind of administration has kind of thought about what they wanted from us, mm -hmm. and they told one person. Right. And that one person then came and said would kind of relay that message, but there was never a time where, I mean, if. You know, if this was a regular job, you know, in a regular company, you would have upper tier management every so often join a team and say, these are what we see and what can you do and what are your needs? And you would have a 20 on one conversation. That's just something that doesn't happen here. I can't right. imagine it happening 
Uh, it did happen. Yeah, and there, I, I have seen a slow transition into faculty being feeling less powerful and acting less powerful. And I don't know that, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know that there's a particular cause. I just think it's been a transition that has slowly occurred. Um, do you, do you, do you uh, have a sense or think that's unique to Valley or is that something that's, you know, within the district or community colleges or? I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't have experience at other community colleges. Which with every um, district, I I, with every school I've seen, that's how it is. Yeah. But I think a lot of it has to do with with the fact that there's so few full-time jobs now, right? Mm -hmm. When you were here, were there a lot more full-timers than um, part-timers? We have actually built up, in our department, we've built up to a, a one, I guess we had nine when I was hired. So we hired two the same year to go from seven to nine, and, we've, and we're at nine right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have more classes. So, um, But as of last year, I think about the same from last year. So it's really a question of how they decided to manage faculty then. It's I, not a question of there's just fewer jobs or other things in, in that is in that vein. Yeah, I um yeah, I don't I don't I, I can't put my finger on any one particular issue, but I know that you know, I think one of the things that contributed was, you know, sort of the revolving door of our presidents. Mm -hmm. Um I think there there have been changes in some administrators who aren't as faculty friendly, mm -hmm. who, who walked in without the same type of, um, I'm trying to be careful with words. Teaching um, experience? Um, and people experience. Okay. Um, in wanting to develop relationships with faculty. And I think that's really important in, in any company, um, in any educational environment. I think it's really important that people have um, a respect for each other um, and want to genuinely work with people and um, and help them. And I don't think all the faculty here feel that. Hmm. Well, I, I, I do know that we've had this conversation many times in meetings where the how um, being a faculty member who's actually heard of, you know, like is listened to by an administrator, mm -hmm. it's hard to get there. And from the administrator's point of view, Hey, we have these meetings. Go to the meetings, right? Right. And but then, from the faculty point of view, to go to enough meetings where someone will finally listen to you, it's it's exhausting. It it can be exhausting. Right? And I think yes. all three of us in this room have climbed that hill. We've gone to enough meetings, right. done enough free work, um, been a part of enough uh, things where they say we need people to be in charge and do this and have no compensation for it that our opinions are listened to at least maybe yes. not followed but yeah. clearly listened to right listened to and responded to right and, and and at the same time i think other people can say the exact same things that we say mm -hmm. and too often they choose not to um and and it's a conscious choice that they just choose not to um you've probably had people say after a meeting yeah that was great john you know i really support that or you know scott that was a great idea and what I want those folk, those same folks to do is I want them to say the same thing because they're, they thought of the same thing. They just didn't want to say it and they were right. waiting for someone else to say it. Right. And, and, I, and I also want to, you know, with the caveat that I get along terrific with my dean. Um, he and I talk all the time. We have a very, very good um, communication uh, between the two of us. Uh, you know, we've socialized. So we have a great relationship and we communicate very, very well. And he works with me um, and I work with him. Uh, and when he needs something, I'm absolutely willing to listen and vice versa. So, Well, I've had opportunities to sort of bump up. And I think for me, I'm always two levels removed from administrators, uh -huh. which is why I have a lot of freedom to Not say. Not a bad thing. Huh? <laughs> Not a bad thing. No, no. So I've, and I've, I've consciously tried not to bump up unless it means a lot more money. Uh -huh. I'm not willing to sort of give up my voice. Right. Because once I'm one level removed from administration – we have to work together every day. Right. And I know that there's that issue also where it's hard to argue with the person that you got to see the next day and right. And get some paperwork done. Right. And right. And, and that, and that is tough. And, and one of the ironies actually, um, I, I was asked to be, um, Dean a couple of times, three times. Um, and one of the ironies is that the people that I think are probably mo best suited to be Dean, you know, um, 
you know, I could say, you know, the two of you, you know, sitting at the table perhaps who, you know, have the experience, who have the demeanor, who have a faculty perspective for the most part, and clearly this is um, true for me, it's I, I don't want to be dean. Right. And, and I think you know, it's, it's ironic that the people that are probably best suited to be dean eventually, I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. that, you know, we should replace any of the deans, um, the people that are best suited to do that um, don't want to do it. So, and the, the former vice president, she she wanted to she wanted me to to do certain things so that I would eventually be dean. She sort of like grooming me type, mm -hmm. um, and I just resisted, resisted, resisted. And then after she left, I I realized like yeah, I can see why you wanted me to do that because yeah. she was that type of person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where she did she did move up from faculty and and she was very people friendly, and had a faculty perspective. I think my issue is is my age. I'm 52 right now. And that first too young? No, if you're if you're <laughs> you know that first job being a dean, yeah. just being first line management, you have no power, but you're you get all the blame, you have no power and really But you, you can't get fired, John. Huh? You can't get fired? Yeah, but you <laughs> I mean, the the job is so rough, we formed our own union. Yeah. Right? They formed their own union of just yes. the deans? Yes. They ha so they had successfully. Yeah, no, but prior to that, they had no leverage one way or another. And to, to sort of bump up uh, to vice president where you can actually start making some choices. Right. I don't know that I have enough years to get there. Oh, yeah, you, you would. Sure you would. I think it's a matter for all of us, too, probably sitting at the table about what level, what level are you removed from students as right. soon as you transition to these various roles as an administrator. Right. So, and the types of interactions that you start to have with students at the dean level or the VP level, it's not the, the type of interactions that you have is, is, is in the classroom. Right. And so at least for me, that's been something that's been a very sort of conscious, intentional decision about, ooh, there's a part of my job, and, and I have a bizarre job as far as the campus goes because I'm faculty, but I'm removed from the, right. the typical faculty duties because of, of the tutoring role, but I'm heavily involved with students, right. whether it's the students who come through the centers or the tutors, yeah. and that is the best part of the job. I, I agree. That's the argument I used. My, my son kept pushing me to be dean, um, and, and I said, look, you know, I, I, can, I, I interact with over 400 students a year personally, and he said, yeah, dad, but think about how many students you'd be interacting with if you were dean, because you could have even a larger effect. And that was actually the, um, the number one reason why I didn't, why I turned down the job when I was first asked. I literally re um, turned it down in the first five seconds. Um, and the, the former dean asked me, well, don't you want to think about it? And I said, um, okay, fine, you know, I'll, I'll think about it overnight. And I knew what my answer was going to be anyway. And I came back the next day and I said, look, here's the deal. Both my kids were in high school, and they were both on the basketball team at two different schools. And I said, look, if you can guarantee that I'm never going to miss one of their games because I've never missed one, if you can guarantee that, then I'll consider it. And he said, well, I can't really guarantee <laughs> it, but, but we can work with you. And I said, if you can't guarantee it, then you know, that's the reason that I, that I went into teaching to start with was to, um, so I could be with my kids. Yeah. There was one time I dropped off my kid at school, more than once, um, and, I, and I worked a full day, and I came back at you know, 3 o'clock. Um, to pick him up, and and he said, "Dad, did you work today?" I said, "Yes, I did," so, and that was yeah. fantastic. I was, I didn't, <laughs> didn't even realize because I was there to pick him up, and you know, and and then you know, still worked at home, but at the same time, that was the reason I went into teaching and wanted to give up my private practice to start with because I worked afternoons, and by the time you know kids would go into school, I would never see them. Yeah. So. There's there's a, a level of uh, flexibility that comes with the teaching jobs um, that's certainly you know attractive of course and then yes. there's also aspects of those dean jobs and that level of management that I am not envious of mm -hmm. um, when you see what goes on and, and you see what what's involved uh, I think it, it becomes a an opportunity for folks to sort of pick and choose where you're going to have the most impact right you know and and certainly and i agree and and to your son's point that yes as as a dean or as a vp your level of impact sort of ripples out in a different way right but again it's the difference between the personal sort of, of interactions that you have with students as opposed to this other institutional impact that you can have right uh, we are we're getting close to the probably the end end, end of our, our time here so i i wanted to, to come back to just a couple of things here uh, we didn't quite get through the total arc of your story it was 99 uh -huh. you're at valley um, we jumped ahead to 2019, 20 yeah. years later. So somewhere in the middle there or somewhere along the way, you were elected chair. You've been chair of the psychology department for a number of years now. Yeah, right. uh, since early 2000s, 2003, 2004. 
and partly by default, um, I was recruited by the former chair, um, and it was a contentious election, and um, and he promoted me, and um, we know now that it was the right decision because the other person no longer works here because he was dismissed from the district. Right. And I'm sort of still chair by default, partly as a service to everybody else in the department, knowing that the learning curve is just so high um, that it's just easier if I remain chair. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, I know that you know somebody else can do the job just fine, and I'm going to give up the job right. <laughs> at some point, probably sooner rather than later. And so, yeah, so I've been chair since 2003. We've gone 2004, whatever it was, and we've gone through quite a few changes since then. And within that, just to highlight, you kind of mentioned it previously, but you are an active writer, publisher, textbooks. Yes. So I started writing for uh, Pearson, a reading textbook. Um, there wasn't anything on the market that was. They provided my first advance. True to my style, when a company asked me to review a textbook, I said yes. Generally, I enjoy reviewing textbooks anyway because I get to learn something. Maybe there's something new in this book that I'm not doing that I'd like to try out. Um, And they paid more. They paid something like $150 for the chapter, which is a lot. And I reviewed it, and it was an awful, awful, awful textbook. And I sent it back to them, and they said, would you do another chapter for us? And I said, no, because the next chapter is going to be just as awful. And they said, well, you know, we'd like, to, we'd like you to do it anyway. And I said, okay. So I remember I, I sent it back to on a, on a Sunday evening by email. I sent it back, and I said to my wife on that Sunday evening, I said, here's what's going to happen. And I tore apart the chapter. I absolutely ripped it apart. Um, and I said to my wife, I said, here's what's going to happen. They're going to call me tomorrow, and they're going to say, will you write this textbook? And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. So they said, will you work with this author? You're going to be a ghostwriter. You're not going to get credit. Um, but will you just rewrite the textbook? And I said, sure. And so they gave me a little bit of credit. Um, his picture is still in the, in the book. But they gave me credit as, you know, with cont- contributions by. And from that one job where I just said, okay, yeah, I'll do it. You know, here's 150 bucks. Yeah, okay. Um, they hired me to, to do three more, check, more textbooks mm-hmm. um, in psychology, a child development, an adult development, a lifespan development. Uh, and then I also did a contributing chapter. I was sort of, I became sort of the rescue author. Mm-hmm. Um, here's an here's an author who's having difficulty finishing her book. Would you write one chapter for her? So I became that author. Wow. Um, and I did. I've done you know chapters um, in books without, uh, you know, with compensation, but without any type of uh, uh, byline or anything. So as we close this out, can we highlight the statistics pathway in, in the program that we have at the college? Because that is something that is is unique to Valley College that, that Ron and, and his department has worked through. Can you share some of the details with us? Sure. And, and John was actually instrumental in, uh, in getting it off the ground as well. This began over two years ago now with, um, with the original draft of AB 705, uh, which wants to provide a faster pathway to transfer and graduation for students who have been having difficulty getting out of the math pathway. And as John knows, the the statistics among students who begin at the lowest level of math are horrendous. They, for the most part, they just don't graduate or transfer. So the California Assembly came up with an idea, and this is not always, it's not always a great idea for politicians to make decisions that impact 114 community colleges but that's what they did and it sort of steamrolled through to to some extent without a lot of ground floor input but the bottom line is that it has been an it has been a boon for students Um, students no longer need um, to take a number of prerequisites before they graduate and transfer in math or what we call quantitative reasoning and math now. And so, and we also have different options. So in addition to math now, students can take uh, quantitative reasoning, which includes statistics, uh, more analysis, more discussion, more critical thought, rather than more computation-heavy, formula-heavy um, math. And so students now have these two different pathways that they can take at Valley College, um, in order to graduate or transfer, they don't have to take a number of prere- prerequisites to get out of either pathway. Uh, there's no there's no mandatory prerequisite in statistics. There's no mandatory prerequisite in math. Um, it's highly recommended in many cases, um, and we don't want students to fail the first time and then go back and then go forward again. But they do have the opportunity to set their own pathway. And in that regard, I think the assembly has. It, it actually doesn't matter what we think about AB 705. It is the law. And we, it's important that we embrace it and that we help students get through Valley College in every way possible, uh, regardless of what our individual feelings are about it. 
And let me, let me sell it a little bit too. Yeah. Um, basically, before you graduated, you had to, to pass a statistics class for most people or um, a trigonometry or pre-calculus class. The problem is, is that the only remediation we had in math was algebra. And for anyone who's taking stats, there's very little algebra in stats. So uh, Ron created STAT 100, which is a non-algebra but pre-STAT preparation. It prepares you for stats. It's like a cheat class. Right. And with Christina Peter as well. Yeah. And overwhelming the number of students who take that class pass, and then they go and take STAT 101 and do very well. Now, the state of California has made it illegal for us to really drill algebra into students. So we were sort of, sort of stuck in this situation where either we change the stat class so it's so easy that people pass without the algebra remediation, or we um, flunk a lot of people. And neither of those options seem reasonable to us. So if you look at a lot of schools that are around us, they've created classes which are fake stat classes. They're basically high-end pre-algebra classes. You just learn how to do percents really well. All right. Now, there's a philosophy behind that. They figured out that if you ask people at their job um, what, algebra, what math they use the most, it's basically pre-algebra. And if you look at people in terms of making choices of who to vote or getting a home loan or borrowing a car, what you're basically using is high-end pre-algebra. So why not have a math class that just focuses on that, which is okay, but you're changing what a degree is. Now, the thing about Valley College that makes us great, because you know we sit here and we'll have a new guest next week and we'll complain about Valley College, but what <laughs> makes us great is that people who come here do well when they transfer. So a person who comes to Valley College and goes to UCLA does better than an incoming freshman, and the people who come here and go to CSUN, they pass. We don't give you a fake education, we give you a real education. and. I had a real hard time having us create a fake math class, mm -hmm. right? Because the definition of what a math class, what a degree would be from Valley College would change. So with Ron, we created a math class that would prepare them for STAT 101 that was more reasonable, that covered, that targeted STAT 101 and didn't teach things outside of what you needed for math uh, for STAT 101. Correct. And what we felt was that. The end class never changed. What it means Correct. to be, what it means to be a valid co Valley College graduate this year is the same as it was ten years and the same as it was twenty years. And most of the colleges in this area, that's no longer true. That that is the case. And in fact, our our closest uh, neighbor, uh, Pierce College, they have um, a two semester program, which the, the Carnegie program, and I'm just going to... Um, Called that way. We can say yeah, math too. Yeah, I'm going to trash it instead of sell it. Um, and the reason I'm going to trash it is because we actually did want to develop a program and actually wanted to adopt Statway. And what I discovered in the first few weeks is it's expensive. It's expensive to train instructors. We have to go to workshops. They don't let you teach it without it. And students have to buy a $200 book. And so what Christina and I did is we essentially built... Um, the same type of course, but it's completely free. There's no, it's um, uh, online uh, educational resources. Um, so students don't pay anything. We built the content right into the course, um, into the PowerPoints. The students get all the PowerPoints. They get everything we get um, other than the test banks. We did the same type of um, preparatory work that a Statway course would, except it's fewer units, it's much less expensive, and it doesn't marry us to any one particular company. Right. And the other thing, too, is that when I first started studying all this stuff, I went to Pierce and talked to their Stat 101 teachers and said, is Statway, could a Statway kid pass your class? And they said, no. We right. have we have students that take that way, come into our class, can't pass my class. That's right. Right? So it's, they change the definition of what their degree is. That's, that's exactly right. And in, in, in our case, other than Christina, there are no STAT. All the STAT instructors from the past, they're still teaching STAT 101. So they haven't changed their curriculum. They're not involved in STAT 100 at all. So all we're doing is we're preparing the students. Uh, like I said, it's sort of like a cheat class. It's like, let me help you get through STAT 101. Let me teach you all of these 
essential skills and you're going to kill it next semester in STAT 101, at least for the first you know, half of the year, you're absolutely going to find it so much easier. And then, and then having that foundation the first half of the year will help you out in the second half of the year. I heard that testimonial from a student two weeks ago. Oh, really? She's taking 101 right now. She took STAT 100 the, the semester prior, and she's like, not for me. This class is a breeze. Like, I feel comfortable. Like, none of the concepts are unfamiliar. Yeah. Whereas the other students who are directly in 101 were having a more difficult time. Right. We've heard yeah. that, too, because we do have um, classes that are completely separate from the traditional. And, you know, I just I also want to um, relate one little anecdote. Um, Laura Scott, who she's, hap she's happy for me to, to mention this. Um, uh, she, was a, she was my student um, here, and she, was also, uh, she also took statistics from Mike Gardner when he was here. And she has said, without Statistics 101, there's no way that she would have graduated and that not only did she graduate, but you know, now she works here as a prof full professor, tenured. Um, and she, she's sort of the poster child for AB705, even though it wasn't even dreamt mm -hmm. up at the time. But she got through Valley College and got her degree, and it wouldn't have happened otherwise, taking statistics rather than a math pathway. Well, Ron, uh, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and sharing with us your, your story that led you here to Valley College and highlighting some of the projects that you're working on. Uh, if folks want to follow up, contact you, find out more information about the, the statistics pathway or psychology programs, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, through email. My last name with an A, Moslera, M-O-S-S-L-E-R-A, at lavc.edu. All right. Thanks, Ron. All right. Thanks, Laura. Thank you.